Hello there, fight friends. We have a special treat today. We have on uh, the camera with us Jillian the Savage Robertson, who is fighting Pollyanna Vienna at UC 297 in Toronto in two Saturday nights. Jillian, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm just super excited to be here and super excited to be able to perform in a couple weeks. <laughs> and, you're, and you're super excited to be able to say everything for the second time because I messed up and I had a technical issue, but it was totally my fault. So thank you for being so good natured about it. Oh, no problem at all. I'm like, I get it. I feel like just me with interviews in general, I'm like, it's been such a learning process for me. So I can only imagine it from the interviewer side. What's it like for you? Do you get uh, calls for interviews all the time? Like for me, I just reached out to you on a social media platform. Uh, do you have other people do the same or do they, do you have management they go through? I uh, yeah, typically I have a lot of people who just like reach out to me on social media. I feel like for like I said, for me, it's good practice too. I need to get better at like yeah. just being myself, being comfortable in front of camera and getting better at talking to people. Uh, and I feel like it's a huge part is just getting practice, practice, practice. It's funny you say that because I, I've never met you in person, but I have watched a lot of video on you in the past, uh, you know, in the past couple of days preparing for this. But even before that, you know, in the past couple of years, because you've been around for quite a while now and you've always seemed to me like you're outgoing and, and, and energetic on the on, on film, on camera. And to me, you don't seem like you need practice. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. But uh, it, it's definitely been a struggle for me from, from the beginning, just like talking to people in general, never mind being in front of a camera, being in front of media. It's been uh, a learning process for me. And like me watching my earlier interviews, I know the whole time I'm literally giggling after every single <laughs> sentence that I say, where thankfully I've gotten out of those ha habits now. I don't know that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, uh, you know, I haven't really looked at it in, in detail, but that's if that's who you are in real life, I mean, that's what people enjoy seeing. They like seeing the reality. They like seeing authenticity. And if that's who you are, I mean, I, that's one of the things I actually kind of liked about a lot, a lot of your interviews. Like you're always, always happy, always smiling, always, you know, maybe giggling. It definitely is who I am. But at that point, it was definitely out of nerves that I was. Mm. It was just a nervous giggle after everything because I don't. I just didn't. I wasn't confident in what I was saying. I wasn't confident in being up there in front of the media. Where now I feel like I've grown into my own a little bit more, and I am confident. <laughs> Where do you think that confidence comes from? Uh, I think it did just, like I said earlier, just practice, getting used mm -hmm. to it. Get, my first real interaction with any kind of media was on the Tough House. So I just mm -hmm. kind of got thrown into the deep end with it 100% where I went from no media ever to then being followed by a camera 24-7 for mm -hmm. six weeks straight. So it was definitely uh, a quick learning process for me there. But uh, even then after that, I would... I would do interviews and literally look like I came out of the sauna after just be dripping in sweat because I was so nervous. Even just like phone interviews like this, sitting at my wow. house talking to somebody and I would look like I was just like, like I said, like I just finished working out just because I get nervous. <laughs> well, you're, you're on the right track. You're doing great now. So that's a step in the right direction. Oh yeah. I'm definitely uh, moving forward, but I, mm. I've said it before. I'm like, it's, it's, it's weird for me how it's so easy to walk into a cage fight, but having a conversation is like the hard thing. You know, it's, it's funny how you mentioned that because some people, the idea of a cage fight, even just a name, it's pretty intimidating, pretty scary. But for me, in addition to, to, to that, but when I watched you on the Joe Rogan experience and you had a great chat with Joe for a while, the thing that I, I took a few things about you out of that, but the thing that I took away the most was that, even though I don't know you on a personal level, I, I get the feeling that you are just living your best life and every moment is just the best moment. You're having a great time. doesn't matter what you're doing. Is that, would that be accurate or is that just the way you came across on film? Uh, no, that is pretty accurate. I feel like uh, I, I live the, I live the life that I want to because I get the, I have the job that I love so much. I feel like, and that's really, that that's what makes it for me is the fact that I'm able to just do what I love every single day and yeah. that, that I can make a living at it. I'm like, that's all that it means to me is it I, being in the UFC means the world to me. So your story is you were born in Niagara Falls, Canada, and at a young age, you moved to Florida. I think it was where later in your teenage years, you started taking, I think like a, like a fitness kickboxing class. And somehow it correct me if I'm wrong at any point, but at some point that evolved into training what is now mixed martial arts and has now further evolved into a professional career where you are very successful. Uh, tell us at what point you sort of knew that you were going to be a fighter and how this was exactly what you just said, what you wanted to do. Uh, I guess I never really like 
new <laughs> for the longest time. I was just training because I loved it. I just kept on mm. going back to training, kept on training more. At first, I was training like, I think two or three days a week. Then it started being every day. Then it started being twice a day, then three times a day plus. So I just kept on training more and more until they were eventually like, Hey, why don't we get you a fight? Like you're here all the time you're training. So yeah. uh, I took my first fight and I just fell in love. Like I, it's really nothing more than a passion to me. I just love it so much. So that's really what's always pushed me and always driven mm -hmm. me. And then when I was a, an amateur, it's like I was able to work with girls that were in the UFC back then. And it's like I could see myself just being able to keep up with them and being able uh, to, you know, just hang with the best girls in the world, even when I was an amateur. So I just knew I had it in me and I knew that I, if I worked hard enough, I would get there. Yeah, for sure. It doesn't hurt that you had some really excellent training partners and coaches. I mean, Dean Thomas is, has, is really widely regarded as one of the best fighter or sorry, coaches that evolved from being a fighter. Oh yeah, Dean is honestly, uh, I feel like he's one of the greatest minds in MMA. I've worked, uh, I, I feel like it, I was like blessed that I walked into mm -hmm. his gym when I was 16. Like out of any gym in the world, I yeah. just randomly like signed up for cardio kickboxing one day at Dean Thomas's gym. And obviously we still work together till this day. I saw him this morning, we work together, we're going to be working together again tomorrow. But it's just, it, I, I really feel that I was blessed because he is just such a genius of the sport. Tell us what it's like training at the goat shed. Uh, training at the goat shed, it's uh, definitely chaotic, it, it, but it's definitely uh, an organized chaos, I guess, where uh, we're always working hard, we're always grinding, and uh, it really, I guess, helps like show that what a fight actually is, because we make a lot of noise during sparring and things like that, mm -hmm. and so it's like when you're in the cage and you have everybody yelling or like talking crap on the outside, it makes a difference for how you're performing and that that's what's going to happen in a fight. So it just makes it more of a realistic scenario. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, how much of your training is uh, devoted to grappling and how much is uh, devoted to, to striking? And do you think striking is ever something that's going to be able to compare to your grappling ability? Uh, I don't know if my striking will ever compare to my grappling ability. Jiu-Jitsu has always just come naturally to me, I feel mm -hmm. like. I started with cardio kickboxing. I didn't start jujitsu, I think, till like a year, year and a half after that. And it's just, I, I picked it up faster and I just always, jujitsu and I just always clicked. So I yeah. think that no, no matter what, no matter how long I train, I think my jujitsu is always going to be better than my striking, but I'm constantly training everything. So it's not like I'm dedicating one time to one thing or the other. I'm usually dedicating my time to mixed martial arts and we're just, we're doing everything yeah. all the yeah. time. Yeah, you can't have one without the other. I mean, you can be the best striker in the world, but unless you, you know, have the rest of the game and, and conversely, you can be the best grappler in the world, but you, you know, the feet, the, the fight starts on the feet and you start striking. So you have to have some ability there. Oh yeah. We're always trying to work everything. And it's like, as a mixed martial artist, you have so much to work. So it's like, you need to constantly just be trying to evolve and just, I don't know, fine tune everything. It's just having to learn striking, wrestling, and yeah. jujitsu. There's just so much in each sport <laughs> yeah so for some of the fans watching might not realize just how accomplished you are in the sport i mean they know your name they know you're a successful uc fighter but even just in preparation for this interview i was revisiting your wikipedia reading your accolades reading your current uc records i'm not going to read all of them because there are a bunch but the one i'm going to stick to is that you have the most submission victories in the female division in the ufc i mean that's pretty awesome how, how does that make uh, you feel when you hear that? Pretty awesome. It's definitely pretty awesome. I'm, I'm proud of it, but I won't be proud until I catch up to Charles Oliveira. I'm like, after my last submission over Piero Rodriguez, I finally got, uh, I'm, I'm tied with a couple people on the males list now. For, yeah. In, in the top 10 for men as well. And I'm like, I just want to keep on climbing, climbing that list. I don't want to just be the top of the women. I want to be the top of the men too. Now that you've gone down a weight class to the straw weight division from flyweight, how, you know, have you had a chance yet to really assess your competition and know, you know, have an idea of, of you know, how well you're going to do in this division as opposed to where you were before? Uh, I'm confident no matter, at flyweight or at straw weight. I, I feel confident. Uh, in my new division, I definitely feel like uh, uh, I. I feel like we're going to see my title run. I've said that before. I know I'm like, I made a mistake my last fight by taking it too quick. I didn't really realize how straw weight would feel on my body. Yeah. And it was 
just too much. I was too burnt out going into that camp, had a terrible weight cut, had a terrible fight because of it. Everything was just downhill because I took a fight too fast when my body just wasn't ready. Yeah. So uh, I feel like that was my first and only learning m a mistake that I'm going to make in this new division. Mm -hmm. And from here on out, you're just going to see me continuously go up. So a title run, that's something you're, you're striving for, is it? Oh, yeah, 100%. So when that does happen, you know, to get to fight in the UFC, you've got to be a, a, a highly skilled fighter. To be successful in the UFC, you have to have a strong team with, with strong minds as well, planning your future. So at what point do you all sit down together with Dean and whoever else is in your confidant or, or in, your, in, your, in, your, in your planning process and sort of, you know, map out how that's going to happen, how you're going to get there? Like, do you, t do you tell yourself, for example, okay... I want to have three fights and I want to be fighting for the title or you just want to like keep moving up the ranks rankings every fight. Uh, yeah, just keep moving up, moving up the rankings every fight. We take it fight by fight, see where we're going to move from the next one. You can't predict how I can't say I'm going to win these next three fights. And then yeah. that's what I thought before my last one, <laughs> you know? So, um, you really just have to go fight by fight and then see how you're going to proceed after that. Yeah. One of the things when I, I, I'm working with a bunch of guys right now, and when I mentioned I was going to be talking with you tonight, uh, they all, the people that, that, that knew you mentioned uh, their favorite moment of you was when you submitted Rose Namajunas in the grappling match. I mean, that wasn't in the UFC, but it's kind of cool still. It's another great accolade to be able to say that you had that kind of success over a former champion. Okay. Rose has been like my idol since, like, I, I, I take that win as like when your idols become your rivals because it was exactly that yeah. moment for me. I've looked up to Rose since I was an amateur. She was in the tough house at the same time. So I was watching her in Invicta when she got that flying arm bar in mm -hmm. like, I think it was like a minute. That was absolutely crazy. Then I watched her all through the tough house. She was one of my favorites the whole time. I've always loved her UFC career. I, I'm pretty sure I cried when she got her belt the first time. Mm. I was, I've always absolutely loved Rose. So to be able to compete against her, it was just an honor to share the stage with her. There's a saying, a, a quote, and I'm going to uh, misquote it because I, I don't remember exactly, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it. It's that you should avoid meeting your idols because you'll invariably be disappointed. What was it like when you met Rose? I mean, is, was that the case or is she as cool as she seems? I guess we didn't get too much of a chance to talk. We uh, yeah. just kind of shook hands at weigh-ins and then uh, grappled. So there wasn't too much of a chance to talk there. But uh, so, I, yeah, I just got, I guess, her feel physically, which honestly, people just see, like, obviously I got the choke in about a minute. So people see the submission. Yeah. Yeah. But all I saw was I could see she was fainting at me before. And I was like, wow, this girl's fast. I'm like, I could just see, like, yeah. how it would be to fight her on the feet. You can see, like, just her fast twitch movements. It would be, like, she's just very athletic, very fast. Like, there's a reason she's a world champion. Do you have any role models or anyone you look up to outside of fighting? Um, I guess outside of fighting, no, not particularly. Mm. Inside of fighting, I would say Amanda Nunes has always been a huge role model to me. Yeah. What do you do for fun when you're not training or and fighting when, and not training to fight? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> When I'm not training to fight, then I'm usually training for fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like, you know, what's funny that that's a common answer amongst high level fighters. I mean, sure that some people could treat this as a job, but the people that are very successful are the ones who are in the gym all the time because they love it. They don't want to do anything else. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a year round job for me. I just love being in the gym. Uh, I love being in that environment. So it, it's just like it's different kinds of training for me, definitely, where I can like mess around and like maybe spar a little bit more instead of focus on so much yeah. technique for, a yeah, yeah. Bit. you know, just play around and have fun and do what I want with training, but then get back to serious training later. So if you don't mind, can we take just a minute or two and just talk about your roots in Canada? I mean, I, I just know what I've read on the internet, so I know that you moved away from Niagara Falls when you were young. Do you still have any family there? Do you have any connections there? Like, do you still consider yourself Canadian when you've been in the States for so long? I still do consider myself Canadian. I love, I, I, I do have family up there too. My grandparents still live up there. Uh, and I feel like every summer, every Christmas, all the time, we were always up there all through my childhood. So even though I was growing up in Florida, it's like Canada's always just, it's felt like home to me. How often do you get a chance to go back? Honestly, since my fight career started, I haven't traveled anywhere that I I, I haven't needed to for a fight. <laughs> so yeah. when I was younger, 
I like all through my childhood and even like my early 20s, I went back all the time, like multiple times a year. But since my fight career started, I all my tra- all my traveling has either been for fights or for yeah. grappling competitions yeah. or for training. So that's the only time I really leave just because I'm so into my training. Nice. What's your fondest memory of your time living in Canada where you were still pretty young when you left? Can you remember much of it? <laughs> my fondest memory? I can remember pushing my brother in a sleigh into a, a creek and he went through the ice. <laughs> and you know, I'm willing to bet that a lot of your friends and, and people down there who live in Florida and come from the Caribbean, they've probably never seen snow, have they? Have they? they that's a really weird thought and random thought for me to have. Oh yeah, no, that, but it's true. A lot of people haven't even seen snow and even me going back there right now, I'm like, I need to get ready for it again. Yeah. I've been buying winter jackets, things like that. I'm like, I don't even have these clothes. Just go to Goodwill and get, you're only going to wear it for like 20 minutes. So yeah, you don't need to spend exactly. a lot of money. I just needed to get up there. Yeah. So let's uh, finish off the interview by talking about the actual fight. So tell me what you know about Pollyanna Vienna. I know Pollyanna, uh, she's a very precise striker and is obviously very comfortable on the ground. She's a black belt. She's a uh, very comfortable in playing guard. And uh, I, it, she's a, uh, obviously we watched her uh, win over uh, Jin Frey where she was able to yeah. get a knockout. So it's like, she does have power in her hands and I feel like she's a threat everywhere really, but um, I'm more of a threat. <laughs> when you visualize the fight and you plan your actions like pre-plan, how would a perfect fight for Jillian Robertson look to you? A perfect fight for me would just be me being able to stick to my game plan, being able to get to the ground and uh, just execute what I do best, which is either ground and pound or getting to the neck and getting my chest. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I've noticed is that every time you fight, you seem to get a lot of attention by like actual fight fans who always comment about, you know, you do have the nickname Savage. There's a reason for that because you're freaking savage in there, man. So a lot of people are really affected by that and love watching you fight. That's got to feel good knowing that, uh, you know, you're a, you're a fighter's fighter. Oh yeah. I, I feel like I'm just always looking for the finish. So that's what ma- that's what gets that, you know, I, I'm constantly going in there just trying to finish my opponent, trying to do damage. I don't want to spend 15 minutes in there. So I, I feel like fans appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I was going to start off the interview with the, the hard-hitting question, but I, at some point I changed it to the very end. So the hard-hitting question, Jillian, are you ready for it? Yes. Jillian or Jill? Um, honestly, the only – my best friend growing up called me Jill, and my dad calls me Jill, but those are the only two people who have ever called me Jill. It's usually okay. it's Jillian <laughs> or G or Savage. <laughs> oh, I like Savage. That's cool. Mm-hmm. When people ask me what I did last night, I was like, I was talking to Savage. Yeah, that works. <laughs> That's pretty badass. All right, Jillian, I have no more questions. Uh, before we get going, is there anybody you'd like to thank? Uh, just to go ahead. Obviously, shout out to Dean Thomas and the Goat Shed. They've been everything for me this camp. And um, we can thank Gordo. He's been a huge part of this Gordo. interview for me. He's a part of all my uh, interviews. <laughs> yeah. How's his, uh, how's his hair doing? Uh, he's doing good. He actually, um, he was born with alopecia, so he yeah. doesn't have hair. <laughs> yeah. And on the back of his spine, right? Like, or is that something yeah. like, do dogs, do dogs have, have mental health issues? Like I know, like when I started going bald, I was really, <laughs> I was, I was not feeling it. Do dogs go through that? You think? I don't know. He might be going through it. He looks a little bit sleepy right now, but I don't know. <laughs> he's, just, he's just content. Okay, yeah, Jillian. Exactly. Uh, I re- it was a, a thrill got to speak with you for the first time. Thank you so much. I know it's, you know, the week before fight week, and so there's a lot of uh, requests for your time. I truly appreciate you speaking with us and MMA and all your Canadian fans. So thank you. Good luck, and we will see you in Toronto. Thank you.